There's a new four-grain bourbon that's been taking the market by storm, Penelope Bourbon. Bottled at the historic Castle and Key Distillery, Penelope's balanced four-grain flavor comes from a unique blend of three bourbon mash bills. Currently available in two expressions, 80 proof and cash drink, Penelope sips well neat but also makes a great Kentucky mule. So look for Penelope's award-winning bourbons in select markets and of course online at PenelopeBourbon.com. The Meltdown Ice Press is an engineering marvel and it turns ice into a work of art by using metal conduction to create a perfect sphere every single time. And it's 100% made in the U.S. But ice balls provide 24% less surface area, which means it's a slower ice melt and less drink dilution. So go check it out now at MeltdownIce.com. I, w- I was so excited, Kenny, that I left my ascot at home and, and came with, you know, just a hat and a coat on. See, we like we like laid back Fred. We Nothing want laid back Fred. <laughs> <laughs> Pants are optional on the round table. I don't think you all do that yet. This is episode 287 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. Before we start today's podcast with the 52nd Bourbon Community Roundtable, here's your weekly bourbon news update. Heaven Hill has filled its 9 millionth bourbon barrel. Now aging more than 1.8 million barrels across 63 warehouses, Heaven Hill's Bernheim Distillery is producing 1,300 barrels per day, making it the largest single-site bourbon distillery in American whiskey. And the 9 millionth barrel will be put up to age in Rickhouse Y, where it will be displayed amongst Heaven Hill's other milestone barrels. And now quickly moving on to bourbon release news. We're excited to officially announce the launch of Pursuit United. I know I've talked about it before, but we're really excited to actually make it official. And this small batch blend is formed on partnerships and not just sourcing. Over the entirety of 2020, Ryan and I, we worked on hundreds of blend iterations to find that perfect balance. And we finally settled on selecting barrels from various mash bills from three different distilleries that ended up at 108 proof. The Kentucky component comes from Bardstown Bourbon Company, and it delivers notes of caramel and maple. And the New York side actually comes from Finger Lakes Distilling, which we've proclaimed our love for before. And it uses their award-winning weeded mash bill that gives it those vibrant fruit notes. And the final component comes from Tennessee, from an undisclosed distillery that is not located in Tullahoma, which means none of those Flintstones vitamins that you might be thinking about and it brings some rich depth in that sweet, sweet oak. Now for this first batch, only 2,250 bottles will be available beginning in January of 2021 with a suggested retail price of $65. You can get it right now on sealbox.com and you can also get it on store shelves in Georgia, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Texas. And you're thinking about it in Texas, you can get it on specs all across all major markets. Now for today's podcast, we're looking forward into 2021. No one could have predicted the events of 2020, but let's see if we can look into our magic eight ball and think about what might happen to bourbon this next year. And Joe from Barrel Bourbon, he wants you to know that it's gotten a whole lot easier to get their unique cast strength whiskeys from around the world delivered right to your door. Just visit BarrelBourbon.com and click the buy now button. Bourbon to your door, it's as easy as that. Enjoy today's episode and here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Jason Brown, who writes to me on fredminnick.com, always wanting to understand the functional differences between stopper types, such as cork, synthetic cork, and glass. Well, let's start with the economical aspect of it, because really that's why people are making decisions on what type of stoppers or closures They want to do it based on how much they want to spend on the bottle. The fact is, a screw cap is much more economical. But when you walk into a store, most people look at a screw cap and think, "Eh, it's kind of bottom shelf. I don't necessarily think that's going to be very good. When you look at synthetic cork, that's kind of like the in-between of like, you know, I trust it. It's got a good seal. It's going to be there. However, with synthetic corks, this is not anything that is scientifically proven. I can just tell you that sometimes I taste plastic in some synthetic corks, especially on the higher proof ones. 
So I am always a little weary of that. And then you look at cork, which there are umpteenth degrees of quality with cork. I actually spent a uh, a good amount of time in cork. I've been on in, in cork forest, so I understand cork very uh, very well. And basically, the more the more little like air pockets you see in it, the the lower quality of the cork. So that's kind of one way of looking at it. Cork is about to have a major resurgence because it is natural. When you get cork off of a cork tree, you're basically shaving off the bark and they take the cork from the inside of the bark. And that tree is in existence for 200 years or more. And it's protected by the various governments that have them like Spain, Portugal, Italy. Cork trees are basically like endangered species. You cut them down, you're going to jail. So cork is a is is a really hot topic right now around the world because we're trying to improve the environment and people are looking at like the use of cork uh, because it's reusable. They're looking at it as a, a great alternative to the plastics and the metals uh, that are used in in stoppers. So typically, the decisions on the stoppers are made from an economic one. Uh, they all kind of hold up, you know, uh, the higher qual- the highest quality of cork, which is used in the three thousand dollar bottles of wine. To be honest with you, those are the best. They go through all types of testing, all types of air testing, and to make sure that they won't oxidize. But if you get down in the lower grades of cork, you know, you're almost on an equal footing with uh, with like a screw cap or a synthetic cap, in my opinion. But I think that you will start seeing a lot more cork on the shelves as people become more environmentally conscious. That being said, it does come down to an emotional feel. More people like to have that feeling and hear that sound of than they do twisting a cap. So I think the future is all for cork, but I hope that answers a little bit of your question. And just remember all the decisions that you, that are made on the bottle are typically made for economic reasons. And that's this week's above the char. Hey, if you have an above the char like this listener, make sure you hit me up on fredminnick.com, hit the contact button and send me your ideas until next week. Cheers. Welcome, everybody, to the 52nd episode, or say 52nd recording, whatever this is. It's the Bourbon Community Roundtable, and we have got the whole gang here tonight, and we are going to be looking at our Magic 8 ball, looking at our crystal balls, just trying to predict the future tonight, maybe some palm reading, something to figure out what is going to happen with Bourbon in 2021. I think it's going to be really kind of fun to kind of go and figure out what these guys think they have in store. and. You know, if I'm smart enough, maybe at the end in December next year, I'll go back and listen to this and see if anybody actually got it right. But I can barely remember what I had for lunch today. So (laughs) there's no way I'm going to be able to remember to go back and do all that. So tonight we have, of course, the whole trio for Burton Pursuit here. Ryan and Fred, how y'all doing? Doing great. Doing great. It's a happy new year to everyone. Excited to be here. Uh, Excited for a new year. I, w- I was so excited, Kenny, that I left my ascot at home and, and came with, you know, with just a hat and a coat on. See, we like, we like laid back Fred. We <laughs> want laid back Fred. Just a hat and a coat. <laughs> <laughs> pants are optional on the round table. I don't think you all do that yet. I mean, I don't, think, you know, I don't think you want to test the pants theory with me. You just, you just really don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's been, a, it's been a great start to 2020 already. You know, uh, I want to say... For ourselves, Ryan and I were super excited and super proud. We've been getting a lot of great press today for the announcement and the release of Pursuit United. Thank you to everybody out there that's bought a bottle, that's tried it. I can't be, you know, more happy than I am now about that. You know, Cobra Kai season three came out. I crushed it in day one. It was awesome. <laughs> like this 2020 is four days in, and I'm I'm having a great time already. So I kept thinking, I'm like, why is Facebook showing me the same Cobra Kai post from Kenny? And then I'm like, oh no, he's just posted about it 55 <laughs> times in the last 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I, you gotta understand, like, I'm a child of the of the 80s, and that was like my coming to tail or coming to, you know, coming to uh, coming of age. Age. yeah, coming of age. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. Yeah, it was my coming of age tale, and it that's really what it was. So I was a big fan of both one, two, and three. Four can kick rocks a little bit, but you know, one, two, and three, those are those are iconic to me. And they just do such a fantastic job of intertwining the story with what they did 30 years ago. For me, it's it just it hits all the feelings. There, there's there's four seasons of Cobra Kai. 
They're on the third right now, but there's going to oh, be. Oh, you're saying Karate Kid 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, yeah. Well, actually, they had a fifth, too, with Jaden Smith, but that one we were a little Karate Kid number yet. four, that was where he went and fought the Russian. Was <laughs> <laughs> Wrong actually, series. Yeah, yeah. That was, it's hard to get them all, all straight. <laughs> all right. Karate Kid aside, let's go ahead and we'll kind of kick this into it. Let's go ahead and introduce everybody as usual. Blake, you've been speaking up, so you go first. <laughs> Blake, you've been interjecting yourself. Why don't you go? <laughs> yeah, uh, as always, uh, always fun to be here. I'm Blake from Bourboner and Sealbox. Uh, Bourboner's B O U R B O N R, and then Sealbox is S E E L B A C H S. Uh, all social medias, uh, websites, you know, Instagram, Facebook, all that good stuff. Um, always fun to be here. This is, what did you say? This is our 52nd? Correct. Um, and so, monumental time. For the um, for the Reber household of roundtables, this is the first time I am hardwired in. What? To, and I also got a computer charger, so I am going to be blasting full Comcast internet, high high speed, uh, high definition camera, 1080p. So uh, yeah, it only took Good me point. 52 episodes to actually get all that worked out and together. So. And then my headphones didn't work, so I had to, you know, have one. <laughs> but you know, yeah, I mean, thanks. usually it takes like five years to find a good stride. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that. I've heard it. <laughs> All right, Nick. Yeah, hey everybody, I'm Nick from Breaking Bourbon, BreakingBourbon.com. Uh, I'm not going to spell it for you, like Blake. Uh, I think probably most of you know where to find us by now. But uh, hey, yeah, glad to glad to be here. Glad to be in the new year. Here, uh, you know, looking forward to, you know, hopefully a very different year than uh, 2020 was. And uh, I like the idea for for tonight's show, too. So I'm, I'm excited about kind of that whole prediction idea and, and kind of see what people are thinking could happen and what then what actually does happen. So glad to see you guys. Yeah, this will be a fun episode. And Brian, go ahead and yep. bring us home here. Thanks, everybody. Happy New Year. This is Brian with Sip and Corn. You can find me on all the socials at Sip and Corn and online at sipandcorn.com, S I P P N C O R N, and bourbonjustice.com. Looking forward to this show. We'll uh, see what my crystal ball has. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go ahead and let's kind of dive into it. Does anybody think they have one that they want to go first? If not, I'm just going to act like a teacher in middle school and I'm just going to just pick oh on somebody. I mean, you're like, it's, we only get one, right? We don't get like several. Well, we'll see. We'll see how long this takes. I mean, if somebody yeah. says something, I'll be like, "Yep, that's pretty obvious." Like, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go back to living life, hopefully. But I mean, if not, we'll uh, we'll kind of see where it goes. All right, I'll well, just pick somebody randomly. All right. Well, in that case, Fred, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Nope. No pants for it. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I predict Fred will not wear just, an ascot. Just an ascot. Oh, oh man, he, he just. He just Brian, named, it a, way, Brian, he named an award I, I, show after. There's no way he can do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. I do want to say I appreciate you having the the bourbon and beyond um you know barrel head behind you. The whiskey's dark past. Uh, I wish I could predict that we're gonna be coming back with, with bourbon and beyond. I don't know where that's going to be, but uh my big prediction of my big prediction of 2021. I've got a lot of them, and there's a lot of things I know that I can't talk about because yeah, I gave a handshake agreement or I signed an NDA to get the information to wait till it comes out. You know, those are some of the uh, things you can yeah. break those. That's not technically a prediction on here. It's we, not a prediction. Uh, if you know. That's, a, that's a good we point. Could, we could get you out of those handshakes. No problem. So, NDAs. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's insider information. That's not a prediction. <laughs> good, good point. Uh, okay. So this is my big prediction. I have no inside information to tell me this. I just know how the industry of bourbon works coming out of like, you know, a tumultuous time. Uh, and I'm talking like trade, trade issues, uh, high taxes, uh, in this case, you know, a, a pandemic. I believe one of the large distilleries is going to be acquired by someone like Pernod Ricard or Diageo. And I think that the distillery that will be purchased in the next 12 months is Four Roses. I think Four Roses will be acquired sometime uh, this year. They're they're sitting they're sitting in a place where they are big enough that they can instantly help people compete. Uh, they're 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 producing stocks for uh, Diageo in Bullet 
And we all know that they famously did that for, for a long time. And now Bullet, you know, acquires stocks from, from several places. But Diageo, I think, is probably looking at like Four Roses salivating right now because I, I do believe it is a buyer's market for something of, of that size and stature. So I think that's my big prediction is that somebody will buy uh, Four Roses. I have no insider information. That's just a gut feeling based on history and you know past reportings and everything. I love how you prefaced all this, but but by like a golly's NDAs and insider information. And then you're like, I don't have any insider information. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You gotta say that. I, yeah. I mean, I mean, Brian as my lawyer, did I do okay with that one? I think you did yeah. great. All right. Didn't we think that before that we thought it's, they would sell? I can't yeah, remember if we did that now. last year. Or... Yeah, yeah. I, I think there was. It was maybe Reddit or somebody had posted that Kieran was going to sell. Yeah, well, there was a uh, there was a rumor that Constellation acquired him. Mm -hmm. um, and I woke up at like three in the morning and called up the uh, people in Kieran in Japan to get them on the record to say that, no, they have not sold. They're not selling. They're not planning to sell. And it was a blog post I did. Um, you know, two years ago, I think, but, um, yeah, but that was, that was then. It, why do you, uh, why do you think Kieran would sell? Yeah. Do you think it's because right now I feel like they're all just riding that high wave. I mean, and, and that's probably the best time to sell, but. Well, my, my thought on that is not necessarily that, you know, name another American property that Kieran owns. You know, I think that's a lot of it is that, you know, these international companies uh, in the year of a pandemic, they have seen how difficult it is to operate internationally. And I think we've seen that the, the difficulties is not going to go away. And, you know, if if you're operating in Japan, you've built this, you have built this distillery, not from the ground up, but you have built it and there have been um it, they've done an incredible job bringing that distillery back and i i just think i just think that it looks it, it is very enticing to someone else and that someone else is you know will going to be willing to write a big fat check for it, it whether or not happen, kieran, but... whether or not kieran says yes i mean i don't know i think that's i think that's the discussion but uh, i just you know you take a look at the moves that are happening um, and I, and I just, I just think four roses would be in, in someone's Is four roses still contract distilling for Diageo. I thought they, they included that contract a little while ago, but yeah. So Diageo is getting, is getting the, as bullets being distilled from several places. And, um, it is a, um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, you know, scenario with, with bullet. Cause we don't really fully know where everything is, but we know when it was, when bullet was, was bullet. Uh, mm -hmm. and that's when it was, you know, it was four roses distillate. And, um, you can definitely still taste some of that in their whiskey today. Well, they bullet has all those proprietary yeast strains, you know, from somewhere. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> but, but that would be interesting if Diageo did. I mean, cause hell they're got, you know, the new bullet distillery and then they got, uh, you know this J J JW Danther building this behemoth of a distillery down in uh in uh, New Hope, or is it New Hope or New Haven somewhere down in my Nelson County parts? Mm -hmm. But they're planning on building a big distillery there. So, um, yeah, that would be interesting for sure. I you know it's one of those where you know Maker's Mark is always rumored to be sp spun off out of the you know Beam Suntory portfolio, and I I just I I just think that you know. If you are a large American, you're, if you're a large spirits company, um, and you don't have one of the big, one of the big six, you know, you've got you've got to get it. And while Pernod Ricard has made some really nice moves, while Constellation has gotten uh, partnerships and outright acquiring High West, they don't have a you know they don't have one of the juggernauts. And I just I just think it's time, and that is one that is is right there for, for the picking. Now, again, you, I don't have look any at, knowledge. When you look at Constellation versus Pernod Ricard versus the Kieran, I mean, what size is Constellation in aspect to them? Like, I don't, I, I personally don't know the size of these companies. And if one is typically or, or considered bigger than the other, 
because yeah, you usually need something to round out that portfolio or have something that really yeah, looks good on paper. Constellation's huge in wine, so they're very yeah. They're Miami very, they're, is like their big brand. They're enormous in wine, um, and um, Kieran Kieran is big, but they're not. You know, they're not. Um, they're not Pernod Ricard big. So Pernod Ricard's number two. Uh, the the spirits companies it goes like um, Diageo's one, Pernod Ricard's two. Actually, I think th I think three is uh, Beam Suntory. Um, and then between like four and like ten, you're gonna have you know I think Kieran's on that like outer edge there. Then you got companies like Proximo, Constellation. And then if you want to throw in, there's a, yeah, yeah. there's a few of them. And then there. also, you know, Miller Coors is getting in the, is getting in the bourbon game. You know, you know, there's just so many, there's just so many of these enormous companies are getting into the game. And if, and if that is, if that is something that can be up for grabs, if Kieran is, is, is open to those talks, you know, they could sell that for a, a pretty nice uh, B number. I feel like. It's interesting. Does anybody else have any other predictions about takeovers or buyouts or anything like that this year? Because I could probably throw another one out there and we'll see what yeah, we think. Yeah, I mean, I think we'll see maybe some of the, you know, more along the lines of like the, the what, or excuse me, the um, Kentucky Owl, you know, maybe like a barrel or a peerless, um, so somebody like that. I could definitely see getting like Constellation continuing to build their portfolio but yeah it'd be interesting to see if one of the major guys got scooped up um you know it seems like kind of the um the route most have taken so far has just been to um you know pick up a wyoming whiskey and then just add them to the portfolio and push them through all the channels you currently have so um yeah we'll see yeah i would think we're probably going to see one of the smaller ones get picked up it's not going to be peerless the way they've structure right. it yeah as far as i know they've got it in the in a family trust and can't be sold and all that i mean they they did it to keep oh it. really yeah interesting i didn't realize that yeah i mean you definitely will see it well i think the the burden on the craft distillers is lessened a little bit because of the craft modernization act passing but you definitely do see you definitely do see a um you see a trend of people getting acquired you do know those those talks are happening and anytime you you see constellation come into the uh, come into the equation, you know, then you know, you know constellation historically acquires you outright within like three to five years. Uh, I think uh, Doug Pendleton in the chat brought up the big big prediction of the night: Amazon buys uh, Sealbox. Yeah, I didn't want to, you know, go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. But me, <laughs> me and Bezos, um, you know, we're taking on space next, so got to get Sealbox, <laughs> got to get Sealbox acquired. So yeah, that that's that's coming in twenty twenty one. And with that comes a better internet package. <laughs> He's already got the advance. That's yeah. How yeah. He, Your advance was uh, the advance was an Ethernet cable. Yeah. So although I didn't mention enough on this Ethernet cable, I don't know how long it is, but my wife was like, "Are you plugging the internet in at your office and going to put your laptop in at the house?" But it's like a solid forty five feet. I'll show up by the end of the show. But <laughs> I love how this took a turn just to that. It always it always comes back to Blake's internet. Always comes back point. to my internet. But no, I mean I think there could. Well, am am I? Um, can I be up? Teacher? Yeah, yeah, go for so, it. Okay, yeah, I, I, and and this is you know a little bit self serving, but I feel like a lot of people who are listening to this are, are also kind of the forefront as well. But just the amount of people who are buying things online, I think we'll see a ton of major distilleries and you, you know Sealbox. We service the smaller brands, um, but Maker's Mark announces that they're going to start doing some online stuff. Ha House Bill four fifteen passed, and they even said in the press release like we think we're, um, you, you know, a good example of what states should be doing. So it's kind of like, who, who's going to be that next domino? Uh, obviously, Kentucky is incentivized with all the distillers, but I could see somebody like a New York or a Tennessee. Tennessee, they're a little more 
backwards in their laws, but definitely like a New York or even like an Indiana, maybe who has in, in Colorado all have really strong uh, distillery scenes and trying to take advantage of some of that online presence. And just the fact that people don't want to, um, it, they don't want to go to the store, you know, much less once the pandemic has calmed down a little bit, um, you know, hopefully in 2021, people are still just used to buying things online. You know, I, I never had Uber Eats until the pandemic and I'll continue using that uh, even moving forward. So I think we'll just see a lot more um, things moving online and a lot more new and interesting releases moving online as well. Uber yeah, Eats is a great, it, I sorry, mean, I was going to say Uber Eats is a great way to double your cost of McDonald's when you need to order it. But yeah, if you want hundred dollar Chick Fil A, it's I, I can it's highly better. recommend it. <laughs> so the the whole shipping thing, it, it seems to really be playing in the hands of the distillers, but you don't see as much uh, enthusiasm at the state level for the retailers outside of a handful of states. And, you know, it seems to me like all the momentum is for the suppliers. And I mean, I look at you know, and I have just gotten in the game of, you know, going back to like the repeal day expo, we had a, a retail partner and people were shipping and I, I got my, and although I'd been covering it and talking about it for a while, that was my first time to really have to deal with a lot of those <laughs> hurdles that you deal with on a daily basis, Blake. And now you see why we drink so much. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it was like, uh, there's like so, states like sending cease and desist orders. You got undercover ABC cops uh, ordering things in the middle of a pandemic when they're not being, you know, going into bars, you know, making sure people are wearing masks. I mean, it, it just seems like it's, it's such a, it should be such a low priority for, for people to, to police that sort of thing. And it's like, why can't those those barriers be down? And you and you when you start peeling back the layers, it's those individual retailers in some markets, it's a wholesaler in another market, it's a legislator in another one. The whole thing just so damn complex. But I do think that we are brick by brick, you know, as someone said in the chat, taking apart the three tier system as we know it. Yeah, yeah I think that's the one good thing that came out of 2020. I hate saying that, but it, it truly was a way that the industry moved forward to be able to start breaking down some of these antiquated shipping laws, to-go cocktails, you name it, whatever it is that kind of you know loosens the belt, if you will, for this particular type of uh, regulation. I am totally on board and I, I hope to see this continue to go. And to kind of echo what you said at the end there, Fred, I see a lot of this ends up being in the hands of just the law. It's the state. I mean, we've looked at this for Ohio is probably the best indication of what this is. Like they completely say all the time, we're missing out on tax dollars because people are shipping bottles into the state and we're missing out on tax dollars. I don't care. Like you've got to figure out some other way to figure this out. Like, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm buying anything other than liquor and I have it shipped into the state, like you're not missing out on tax dollars that you're not missing out on the sales tax. Like it's coming from somewhere else. So they've just got to figure out a way to, to mitigate that and have it be a better system for, for everyone. I think it's going to start with the states, especially to put the time and resources and money already into investing into the distilleries in their home states, which I know is going on a lot in New York. It's going on in a lot of other states too. You know, they're geared up for it. I think with the pandemic, the states are going to be starving for revenue. They're going to be looking in creative places like that. And you're going to see some of these bigger states kind of get on this bandwagon and start to promote this, you know, more. I think we're going to see it with other things. We're going to see it with marijuana. I think we're going to see a lot of more laws change there. And I think as people get used to the idea of opening up something like that, you know, recreational use of a drug, for example, suddenly shipping alcohol doesn't really seem that, you know, that extreme, that old argument of, well, how do you make sure that they're 21, you know, when they get it? Well, look, FedEx and UPS are probably much more qualified than the 18 year old at the gas station selling liquor, you know, that's supposedly checking ID, for example, and they can hold those companies more accountable. So I think it's kind of breaking down, like, like somebody just said, brick by brick, breaking down those barriers, have, having a couple of leading states, you know, like what happened with wine, you know, we just have to get now alcohol into the mix and see that as an acceptable thing to, you know, ship in the form of 
in the form of liquor, in the form of, you know, what we have not been used to before. And what's going in a lot of times now is, you know, as, as wine, as it goes through the mail, you know, so to speak. So it's, again, just kind of getting that one step, that one move forward. I think we're going to see a big move hopefully this year. I love you those know, Nick, you up an interesting point about marijuana. I've kind of seen the, the, the tides turn a little bit more into the favor of marijuana, you know, across the board. From a health perspective, you've got like, and I talk about this all the time, but you have like the the health community just attacking the alcohol industry like left and right right now. I mean, by, uh, you know, some doctor standards in the UK who gets accepted by everybody in the medical community, just being in the presence of all this alcohol, I should have 15 forms of cancer. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on to the next one. Nick, you're up. All right. So maybe not as, as, as big and bold and I've got a few, but I, I'll start with one. Um, so I'm kind of seeing where this whole pre-mixed cocktail seltzer, et cetera, you know, the, this craze of kind of getting the flavors right into the bottle or the can or whatever. I think we're going to start to see that explode more into the whiskey space, you know, where we're going to have a lot of that at our fingertips, whether it's going to be depending on how state laws work at the grocery store, at the liquor store, uh, you know, both, or, or they're both sold in the same place, whatever the case might be. Um, but I think we're going to see that start to become much more mainstream and much more kind of, you know, tied into what we think of as kind of whiskey in the whiskey world and, and the spirits world. Like RTDs in general. Yeah. I think, I think we're going to see that really take a big step forward. We're going to see a lot more people, um, interested in, in, you know, that market's going to get bigger. I think. Even, yeah. Well, even, even with the pandemic a- continuing on, like, like this year, for example, I spent more time than ever at the lake or camping or doing whatever. And like, you know, Kenny came to the, my boat with me and what he brings some RTD margaritas. We had them. We loved them. Next time I go, I buy some more. Now, now mm-hmm. people are just, and I think that's going to continue on people. I don't know. I kind of like this year in the sense that I like to go on the lake. I like not being as busy. I like doing things outside. And, uh, and you know, and what goes perfect with that is RTDs. I don't want to pack a bottle of bourbon and bitters and all this stuff, you know, to make something. So it's nice to have a can, you know, out on the lake or whatever. So yeah, I totally agree. Just like the craft beer movement. When I go to, when I go to the store to buy beer, you know, if it's not $15 for a four pack or more, I'm like, it's probably garbage. You know, there's this whole idea that it cost a lot to be good. And I think the space and there's ripe to make a huge amount of profit and people are going to start jumping on that bandwagon. Sorry, Fred, go ahead. Yeah. So there, there's one thing that is, um, so what you all are talking about are, are basically distilled spirits that are turned into cocktails and put in a can. Uh, they get, um, they they get taxed differently than say like a white claw or like a zima used to so they actually still get taxed like a uh, a spirit i know there's some efforts to change that but the reason why you know you'll see more things like white claw and like what anheuser busch is doing which anheuser busch is calling itself a seltzer company hmm. in some circles is that they they they're not getting taxed uh, the same way, and I don't I don't actually know the the structure, but I know that White Claw is paying a a much less tax than uh, the Jack Daniels, you know, uh, Lynchburg Lemonade, and and that's one of the things I I know that they've been working on. I know that it gets treated differently, but I don't know uh, to the extent. You know, and a few years ago, we started seeing like bottled cocktails come to the rise and that just didn't it just didn't fit because you'd have to consume the whole bottle in almost like wine. It just didn't work. And um, and but the, I'm telling you, I've had some um, I've had some of these canned cocktails and they're amazing. My favorite canned cocktail is one called Symphony and it's out in New York. It's made with New York rye. And it is it is gorgeous. I mean, it's as it's as good. I mean, it would rival a, a Ryan Cecil cocktail. <laughs> no, no, it'll never come to that with the messed up floater. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, did you see him turn that spoon upside down? To, 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 I mean, huh. which it is. Uh, it's interesting. So I was in the grocery store the other day, and I noticed. So our grocery store it used to be, you know, ten years ago, you'd have 
10, 12 options on craft beer. And then, you know, five years ago, it was like half the case, you know, half the aisle was craft beer. The other half was, you know, just domestic stuff. And now it's actually scaled back where it's like a third is seltzers and, you know, all these other kind of light options. Then there's about a third, um, you, you know, craft, well, probably about a quarter craft and then whatever else is left for, it, so it's almost like the craft beer market is getting uh, eaten up by this. And I don't know if that stands out in the numbers or if craft beer drinkers are going to hate me for saying that, but it's true. Like uh, I, I think that's kind of where people's taste are going and something that's, you know, easily um, poured into a cup over ice and delicious goes a long way with kind of where we all are. The numbers are there. They, they the craft oh, beer yeah. market's been getting squeezed now for at least the past year and a half. I don't want to get too much off onto that, but uh, I put a, an article in the chat. Uh, the question is like, there's a ready to drink and then there's flavored malt beverages. Mm -hmm. And basically it's a 15% um, alcohol by volume thing, but that there's an article in the chat that explains the tax situation. Yeah. I think that's where, where a lot of like the, the, you know, ready to drink cocktails, they'll do the malt beverage because it is cheaper because they fall under like the beer wine tax instead of the liquor tax. Right. Is that what right. the, that's exactly right. We won't make you read the article word for word <laughs> on air, but I think <laughs> they've already looked at kind of the, the, the summary. Um, but, the, but the recipe is right. I think the recipe is there where we've got a market that's eager for it. We've got a market that's willing to pay a premium. So now, even if they have the higher taxes, the more difficult, path to market, suddenly it looks a lot more appealing. And, you know, I think maybe Ryan said it or Fred, you said it too, you know, the difference of like a pre-mixed bottle that you're going to, you know, pour, you know, six, eight, 10, however many times, you know, depending what it is versus just one can, you know, just one serving, basically, that's a lot more convenient, you know, so people are going to be willing to spend that eight, 10 bucks, maybe per serving on something that's really good. And they don't have to worry about saving it or they're out, you know, on the boat or hiking or whatever it, they, they, may, they may be, you know, and think about what do I do with this next? You know, it's just one and done. And I think I think the market's ready for that. You know, the other added to it, it Nick, is that, you know, sometimes I just want to kick my feet up and crack open a cold one. And mm -hmm. there's nothing when you have something that's good that's in a can, you can hear that that sensation. Yeah. Especially when it's hot as hell out. I mean, you can't drink, <laughs> right. you can't drink bourbon when it's hot. It's like oh, that's when you had ice. You gotta have some, you know, it's a little easier. But yeah, yeah. I think uh, Power of Bourbon had a good point in the chat about you know craft beer did what I hope bourbon doesn't do, which is continue to raise prices higher than people are willing to pay. And I really hope that it's kind of a separate subject, but it's like, can they get away with just selling? cocktails to make their money and like we don't need you know a hundred new releases every year with special edition and all that and i think that could be an interesting 2021 prediction of you know the amount of new kind of limited edition or uh you know new special releases that we'll see we've already seen it from sazerac they seem to continue to pump new releases um as well as most other distilleries so Who's going to have the biggest new release of 2021? Yeah. They're going to keep coming. Yeah, I was about to say, uh, like it's it's at this point, all you have to do is go find 20 barrels somewhere in a rick house and slap some kind of crazy thing against it and sell it, and it's it's going to sell. Like that's what makes headlines. You want to constantly be in a continual news circle. That's we all feed into it. We all wait for the press release to come in our inbox, and who's going to be the first person to post it? You know, like that's it's and, and it's not just us. It's the other 400 people out now in, yeah, oh, in the yeah. world. Right. Yeah. So I, I don't see that that stopping anytime at all. And all right. there's still occasionally a magazine that I'll. Yeah, out. Well, they're, they're about three months behind the release. But, hey, you know, they get there. Sometimes, they have, sometimes they have websites. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll go with my uh, my prediction here. Are you a private barrel club looking for total control over your own label? Or perhaps a retailer wanting low minimums on a private label bourbon that sells. Or maybe you're just a business, an organization, or charity, and you're looking to make a statement with your own gift of a barrel pick. Indiana's own Krogman's makes it super easy. 
make the pilgrimage to Bloomington, Indiana, where tucked away in the old Otis Elevator Factory, you can select your own barrel or barrels and discuss every detail of your bottle, from the label, the cap, and the closure, and create something truly unique. So stop putting stickers on picks and take your club to the next level. Go to krogmans.com. That's K-R-O-G-M-A-N-S dot com to learn more. I'll go with my uh, my prediction here. So we all know that celebrities have been getting into bourbon recently. Uh, I'm going to have one prediction that says at least five celebrities are going to come out with the new bourbon in 2021. Oh. However, one of them is going to be a rapper. Mm. And that's, that's going to be my prediction. I, I did some research before I thought of this, and I, I saw that Drake is the only rapper that actually has a bourbon. It was called Virginia Black. It came out in 2016. And it wasn't that bad. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> was it MGP? Yeah, yeah it was like two-year-old MGP. It, it said it was like a blend of two, three, and four-year-old stuff. But I, I do predict that there will be a rapper that comes out with a a bourbon this year. Are you that rapper? Because from the intro, you know, uh, I, your beats. I do not spit hot fire, my friend. <laughs> yeah, I think you all ought to uh, collaborate with a rapper. You ought to start, you know, get a hold of Ludacris. Oh, Ooh, I'd be down. Say, didn't we talk about or, or just the yeah, Fred had Ludacris had on. the interview, but. But wasn't he going to do some kind of label? Maybe not. This, no, is, the not inside, this is the NDA portion here. This yeah. yeah. That's why Clearly, I'm just, it, I'm this like, trying more to read, Fred can't talk. <laughs> I'm trying to read Fred's facial expressions. I, I throw a bit out there and I see how he, if does he squirm? Does he not squirm? <laughs> it's pretty, it takes a lot to make me squirm, Blake. <laughs> Kenny and I spend a ton of time in Memphis. I'd, I'd love to do one with 36. Yeah, yeah, get some Project Pad right. up in there. Yeah, no, something yes. like that. Yeah. You know, I, I think my hair. Okay. We're so low. I think we got to wait for them to either come to us or we need to set our <laughs> expectations a lot lower. <laughs> yeah. I, I will so. say, I, I will say like, if you want to take a look at like investors, there already are rappers uh, who have invested in, um, in spirits brands uh, in bourbon. And, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about be more the face of it. Like sure. that's, that's what I'm thinking. You know, when you think of, uh, you know, you know, the Kirk, Kirk bourbon and, you know, everything like that when you think of those kind of celebrity bourbons. So my question then kind of, and maybe back to you, Kenny, but to everybody, I mean, so what do you think when you see one of those celebrity whiskeys come out? What's your, what's your kind of like initial just gut reaction to a celebrity <laughs> face whiskey? Red flags initially, but it, I know it's good for, oh, I think it's good overall for the category, but always first I'm like red flags, <laughs> you know. Yeah, we've talked about it before. We know that usually a celebrity whiskey isn't trying to appeal to us. It's trying to appeal to the broader market. And if there is, I, I think it all goes back. I saw somebody talking on one of the forums about, you know, Blake Sheldon's like Jack Daniels pick, Jack Daniels pick, and it was selling for like 30 or $40 more than regular Jack Daniels. And all it was is just his, his name on it. It doesn't mean anything. Most of us, we don't, we don't care. However, there's going to be a ton of fans out there that don't know much about whiskey that just want the bottle. So, right. Yeah, like the yeah, I, they'll, sell. Sell. they'll all sell. sell. Yeah. Here's 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 the truth of the matter: is a lot of what's driving this is um, are are the people who are sitting on stocks, reaching out to like managers and everything, and and then you have managers who are trying to get uh, their clients' money, and this is a very difficult time to be a musician. So if you can get, if you can find new revenue streams for your uh, for your musician client. And you're, you know, you're keeping them above water while they can't tour. So, um, I, I think the, the, the belief that there will be more musician labels is accurate, and I am privy to a lot of them that I can't talk about. But it is, uh, it is definitely a trend that will continue, and a lot of it has been brought on by the pandemic, and uh, and people trying to find new revenue streams. While at the same time, uh, you have uh, Terra Sencha or uh, Green River now, and a bunch of other you know people putting stuff out on the open market that's bringing prices down a little bit. So you have people like Charles Woodson, uh, you know Hall of Fame, you know NFL safety getting in the game, and um, and so and also Terry Bradsh Bradshaw and, and Rusticulous, and, and yeah Rusticulous. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of you're seeing a lot of like sports celebrities, and you're going to see more musician. You know, but but a lot of it is it's it, it's just people looking for other revenue streams. And to be honest with you, I, I 
you know, I, I name a best celebrity whiskey of the year for a reason. It's because I want to see the, I want to see the celebrities get involved and I want to see the whiskey taste good. And if we don't, if, if, if we just, if we just bitch about it, because they're not going to go away, if we just bitch about it, we're just going to be in a vacuum. But if we encourage them to put out good whiskey at a reasonable price, like what I believe, you know, that, you know, Slipknot did, uh, then I, I think that's, that's good for the culture. By the way, you know, Slipknot, which has won that award for me two years in a row, they're working with Cedar Ridge Distillery, which until Slipknot came in and put their label on the stuff, most of the country didn't know about them. You know, so in, you know, Clown, uh, the percussionist, is is doing the blending so i just i just think that you know that combo is 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 the perfect combo but if a celebrity's coming in just slapping their name on it not going to work it's not going to work and it in and they their name does not sell in liquor stores yep. the the data has been very evident about that they can get the they can do a tweet or they can do an instagram post and with one um uh with one thing they they can sell out a liquor store but it's the, people have to come back and buy it again and so they have to. There has to be a story. There has to be some kind of resonating with it uh, in order for it to work. Otherwise, they, they they won't work. For sure. All right, Brian. What's your prediction? All right, I'm going a little bit technical, and and part of this is based on what Fred said on our last episode about Heaven Hill always coming in at the max uh, distillation proof and max barrel entry proof, um, and I started thinking. There, there's people doing it better. There's Wilderness Trail knocking it out of the park. There's Peerless coming in at low barrel entry proof. And I think the success of those brands is going to rub off on the huge distillers. And we're going to see Heaven Hill lower their barrel entry proof this year. Ooh, mm. I would love that. Hey, are we are we taking bets on that one, Brian? Yeah. Well, because <laughs> I was going to say, we talked about that on last uh round table about you know they're one of the only ones who does weeded bourbon at 125 right mm -hmm. right and we're talking about that's too too hot too hot for the weeded bourbon and too hot to handle too hot to handle and so i think we're gonna see that i mean you've got four roses at 120 so let's you know back off at least five percentage points or five proof points and give it a whirl at 120 They've got so many barrels, like 1.8 million barrels of, of aging bourbon. They've got enough of that, the hot stuff. Let's let's back it down a little bit and give it some time to see see what that does for you and if it doesn't cut into the profits too terribly much. I think that's the boldest prediction of the night. I really <laughs> love it. Okay. I hope bold. it's true. I, it's, like, like I say, part wishful thinking. Because Heaven Hill's like, it's great in the 6 to 15 range but like mm -hmm. before that it's terrible and then after that it kind of you know it's mostly tannicky and but uh yeah i would love for him to lower the proof because that mash bill is great but it it takes a while to get there brian are you are you seeing that maybe across the board or are you seeing that as a like a small sample kind of uh you know test batch to see how it goes over the next five to 10 years? What I would think it would have to be on, on a test or percentage basis. They're not going to do it across the, the line, but they got to at least try it out on, on some barrels and, and keep their 125 on the others, but they got to give it a whirl and then I see, see what it looks like six years from now. I, I mean, the hard part is I think if you look at it from a pure financial aspect which i think most distillers are mm. you, you know if, if you go from 125 to 120 so you know you're talking about less than about four percent three percent whatever that is so you're increasing your barrel cost by three percent well that's probably millions of dollars for a lot of these people uh to their bottom line um that's why I love small distillers. They can do that, yeah. and it's not. <laughs> right. yeah, it's it's a much smaller well, dollar figure once you do yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, and Heaven Hill's got time on their side. They've got time in stocks versus the smaller distillers who don't, and they've got to get something out the door at a younger age, and lower barrel proof actually, or entry proof makes that happen. Yeah, you listen to it earlier. You, you bottle it barrel proof, though, and, I mean, you just you have a lower barrel proof, but at yeah. the same time, you're, you know, you can – play with that yield right i mean you're you, depending how you bottle it you know it depends if they try to create a new brand out of it or you know do something you know in one of the existing lines or not yeah 
This is, this, they yeah. can just do one day. One day is fifteen hundred yeah. barrels. That's you know? right. Well, <laughs> like, I just think do they one day. Have and it'll end up being worker there in ten years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're going to call it uh, sipping corn edition. The park. <laughs> <Sipping corn. laughs> they better get trademark rights for that. Mark this date. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I was like, we're going to all have gray hair and walkers, and we'll be like, see, we told it was going to come. We knew it <laughs> fifteen years ago. <laughs> All right, Ryan, come up with a final prediction here for us. All right. Uh, well, until we get a vaccine, I think this is going to be a continual trend. Um, I think there's going to be about 59 new bourbon podcasts started <laughs> and about 37 more YouTubers with top 10 list uh, to come out for this year. I'm joking, but uh, I, think that that seems like a, I think that happened in the amount of time you started there, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but for my serious prediction, I think the uh, mocktail uh, scene is going to grow. Uh, maybe not for us, but um, I don't know. I talk to younger kids and I read the, you know, Mark Brown's reports and they're just not into booze. And I think it's a concern, you know, that from that 18 to 25, 26 kind of range, they're not into booze as much. And in and, and like these little hipster towns and stuff, they're, I don't know. The mocktail thing's kind of catching on. It's yeah. Let them have kids; they'll change their mind. <laughs> <laughs> but, but with the, you know, with the legalization of marijuana, they're you know yeah, doing I mean, that yeah. and then yeah. doing uh, the mocktails with it. So I don't know. I think that could be um, again, something to think again, about. This all just goes back to the to the to the effort to um, in like about alcohol being bad for you. This is being driven into people's brains for the last decade. And, you know, the spirits industry is just riding on on up with it, you know, uh, you know, talking about mocktails and promoting mocktails. And it's a good look for now. But what happens in 10 years from now when people are like, you know what? Um, we survived. <laughs> we're, we're going to restrict the amount of alcohol that you can consume. You know, it's not going to be a pro it's not a prohibition, but you're only legally allowed to have two drinks a day. I mean, listen. Uh, people can never forget that prohibition happened and we, the, the same efforts are happening right now in city governments in county governments and states and at the federal level. It's the people who are telling you that, you know what, you're going to die of cancer if you drink bourbon instead of like allowing you to have that kind of uh, have a choice and to maybe that actually you can drink in moderation and so that's spread to the to the younger audiences that what want to live healthy lives, and you can live a healthy life if you with with whiskey. What whiskey yep. a day? I mean, look at Fred; he's healthy as a horse over here. <laughs> Knock on wood. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. if you think about like cigarettes, I mean, you know, think of the days when you know you go to like people were just smoking cigarettes in their offices. I mean, it was just like commonplace where everybody was sitting around smoking and. Then it came out of there, and, and next thing you knew, it was in restaurants in the smoking section. And I know in New York, when it got banned from bars, there's uproar from people. But when you think back on it, it's like I, I can't even like just imagine going to a restaurant and there being a room or a whole area that's just filled with cigarette smoke, and just thinking of how disgusting you know that was, and kind of now even sometimes the stigma that can be attached to it, you know, and you just don't see people smoking cigarettes, you know, I guess like they, like they used to, like it was when it was commonplace and that's kind of been ingrained in us. And, you know, they've slowly moved that out of the mainstream and out of where, you know, where people are congregating, you know, would, would that ever happen with alcohol? I mean, are we going to do a reversion where people move to smoking weed instead because it's healthier and, and now, you know, having a beer is the thing that people frown upon, you know, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that I could see it going that far, you know, in a sense, you know, but there's, there's definitely an, I think an eye on health and, you know, maybe these other things are competition in a way, you know, if you bring in, for example, you bring in legal marijuana, that's, you know, that's competition. You're looking to do something over the weekend. Maybe it's one or the other for some people, you know, for sure. Let's go ahead and let's start wrapping this up. Um, if you have one more prediction, there's going to be no comments, but go ahead, spit it out there. And we'll see what people uh, think in the comments or anything like that. All right. So, uh, well, I, I got two. I'll spit them both out. Same idea. I think uh, I think we're going to see a big Sazerac Buffalo Trace release, like barrel proof Buffalo Trace or a, a new entrant to the BTAC. 
uh, BTAC collection. And I also think it's a possibility to see an aged maker's mark, you know, come out something different for limited release. I think everybody is looking to get mind share. It's the time for limited releases. You want to get it. And I think with bigger companies, you can get it now and you can keep it and hold on to it for a long time. So I say we get prepared for some big things this year. Ooh, I like that. Kenny, let me jump on that because I've got something similar. All right, go on. Go on, Brian. I've got something real similar to that. And this is really wishful thinking. I'll tell you that because I've been saying this for years. But Beam is going to come out with a limited edition 15-year-old old old crow. And they're going to take it off the bottom shelf. They just sold all of those totes of the 15-year some of those are doing remarkably well. Someone at Beam has to realize what kind of fantastic age stock they have. Mm-hmm. And they got to slap an old crow label on it and sell it for $350. People will line up around the corner for it. And we should all be happy that old crow comes back. Interesting. I love take. it. Yeah. I had some old crow this weekend. It was great. Not the new one, old one. <laughs> <laughs> Blake, you, you stuttered for a second. Did you think you had another one there? No, no, I had like a prediction on what was his internet, his later life and our future of of uh y- you know us being able to take kids to distilleries and breweries will be like you know our gen- parents' generation being able to smoke cigarettes in restaurants and everything around kids. But <laughs> that's that's a whole other. I'm gonna piggyback off of Brian's a little bit, and I don't think they'll do it with Old Crow. I think they'll do it with Basil Hayden. Um, and I, prove I, it down to like 90, yes, or 80, 80, 80, 80. 80. I, I think we'll see like a, cool, a, a 80 <laughs> proof 15 year old Basil Hayden in 2021. Good deal. Uh, Fred, did you have one more you want to throw out there? So, I put this out on my blog at fredminnick.com. Um, but I am tasting barrel finishes sweeter and sweeter by the year, and I think that this is the year that someone pulls out a hydrometer or something to uh, test sugar levels as we do in rum. And we're going to start taking a look at who's being, uh, who's being honest about their special barrel finishes to make sure that no one's adding any flavor packets. Uh, I'll, I'll throw one more out there because I saw this on a, on a forum because the TTB have has new approved sizes for 700 mLs, 500 mLs, and also 1.8 liters in new bottle sizes. And people said that, oh, they're going to go ahead and rebottle everything and keep the same prices. Uh, nobody knows packaging closer than Ryan and I. That's a pain in the ass. You'll never see that happen. So if anybody thinks that's going to be the the new norm, think again. No way. Nope. Too expensive, too big, cumbersome. Yeah, won't have it. All right, with that, let's go ahead and we will close it for this particular recording of the roundtable. I want to say thank you, everybody that joined us. If you want to stay on, we'll probably have a chat here afterwards because I know Blake's got a he's got he's got all kinds of questions stirring in that head now. <laughs> but I want to give you all one last chance to give a kind of close out of where people can find you out on the interwebs. Blake, you go first, buddy. Yeah, guys, as always, a lot of fun. I, I hope we uh, see a lot of these predictions come true. But the biggest prediction is we all get together in 2021. So hopefully we can make that happen. Um, once again, Blake from Bourboner and Sealbox. And thanks again for having me. For sure. Nick. Yeah, I can say I, I like that prediction, Blake. Also, any brands listening, I think any of the bottles that do get released, uh, automatically we we get the first bottle from, from those patches. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah. yeah so nick uh from breaking bourbon breaking bourbon.com uh find us uh, at, on all the socials uh at breaking bourbon and again uh great show great to have everybody participating a lot in the chat so fun night guys especially sure. that b-tech edition i want that new one there yeah. you go We'll, we'll talk afterwards and see what we can come up <laughs> which with one would that it be one. yeah we'll come up with some theories here in a minute <laughs> brian go for it All right. Thanks again, guys. And uh, look forward to being, we'll see everyone in person again. I hope that's what comes true here, but I'm Brian with Sipping Corn. Find me on all the socials at Sipping Corn and online at SippingCorn.com and BourbonJustice.com. Thanks guys. For sure. And make sure you follow Bourbon Pursuit wherever you get your podcasts and also all the socials. Uh, Fred, you go ahead and do your, your little closing here too. give everybody a shout out where they can find you. Uh, go to fredminnick.com or um, hit me up on any of the socials. And I got a YouTube channel. Just search for my name, Fred Minnick. Easy to find. Cheers, everybody. Thank you again. And we'll see you all next week. Peace. Cheers. Cheers.